Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Japanese Studies Fall 2021 Lecture Series event for this evening, uh, December 2nd. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements before we get started. Before we get started, I guess first I'll say my name is Greg Lawrence. I am the um, Director of Graduate Studies for the Center for Japanese Studies and a Professor of Management at the University of Michigan, Flint. Um, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, on uh, next Thursday, December 9th, I'd like to invite everybody to please join us for a presentation titled Creation of and Participation in Networks, Visiting the Japan Biographical Database, uh, given by Bettina Gromlik Oka, Professor of Japanese History, Faculty of Liberal Arts at Sofia University in Japan. I would note that uh, the start time for that event is the same as this evening's, so 7 p.m. Eastern Time, um, 9 a.m. Uh, in Japan, if that happens to be where you are. All kinds of different times if you're anywhere else in the world. Um, for future programs, please do check the Center for Japanese Studies events page um, and UM or various social media. Um, for this evening's event, you'll notice that uh, attendee webcams and microphones have been muted, but we would invite you to make use of the Q&A function here in Zoom during the lecture to submit any questions that you have as we go along. Uh, when we get to the end of the talk, I will uh, filter through those and, and moderate a discussion, a Q&A section with the, with the speaker, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So I'd like to take just a very few quick seconds to introduce our speaker uh, for tonight's talk. Um, he has a long and varied career in Japan working in investor relations and corporate communication and almost finally as Dean of Temple University of Japan from 2002 to 2007. He's the founder, president and chief sailing officer and as one of my colleagues mentioned, this is almost the, certainly the first time the Center for Japanese Studies has had a speaker with this job title of Kompira Consulting based in Fukuoka, Japan. Most everything that happened between his retiring from Temple University of Japan and his founding of Computer Consulting will be included in his talk. And as I'm sure you'd rather hear about that from him than from me, I will turn the floor over to my good friend, Dean Kirk Patterson. Kirk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. Uh, good to uh, hear you on the screen there. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, this presentation. Um, Today, I would like to talk about Japan as a marine tourism mecca. Uh, my presentation will mainly be a lot of photos uh, and, and a bit of dialogue about what they represent. First, a little bit about my background. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I was the Dean of Temple University of Japan up until 2007. I'd always wanted to sail, to be an offshore sailor, uh, perhaps because my father was in the Navy. I wanted to go over the horizon, my own boat, but I never actually sailed at all in my life. And at 54, I decided it was time to stop talking and start doing. Uh, so although I love my job at Temple Japan and, and really want to continue, I also realized that I didn't have too many more years to learn how to sail and to go sailing. So I uh, left Japan, expecting never to return to Japan again in my life. Uh, and went back to my uh, native uh, home city of uh, Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, bought uh, Silk Purse, uh, a lovely steel boat. So this, is, this is a photo of me on the day that I purchased Silk Purse. Uh, little did I know that I know, little did I know anything about sailing, but little did I know what adventures would, would lie ahead. Silk Purse is a 40 foot steel cutter rigged sailboat. Um, the previous owners had had her built in Canada and sailed her to the Caribbean, across the Atlantic to the Mediterranean and back to the Caribbean, had her trucked uh, to British Columbia where I bought her and then uh, continued to sail her. I, uh, back to Silkhurst, I sailed for four years up and down the British Columbia, Alaska coast. Um, always so solo from day one. I figured if I'm gonna cross the Pacific uh, solo or go around the world solo, um, I should start from day one being solo. Uh, so uh, a few adventures along the way, a few broken 
things in my boat and on marinas, uh, but uh, I survived and the boat survived. And so after four years of cruising the BC Alaska coast, it was time to head off. Initially, I had not planned to, to come to Japan, but somebody said, well, you know, no foreigner has ever circumnavigated Japan. So I said, oh, well, I, I can do that. There's this little thing called the Pacific Ocean in between, but I'll just cross that and I'll go to Japan. And then the plan was to, after Japan, uh, which I thought would be two years, uh, then continue to the South Pacific and around the world. Uh, but as they say, life is what happens when you're making other plans. So I set off uh, leg one, 2012, sailed from Victoria to Hawaii. Uh, it was a 30-day uh, a uh, passage. Uh, generally, uh, good sailing along the way. Um, you know, being my first real offshore passage, there were some scary moments, but our, the scare was really because of my inexperience, not because of the conditions. It was actually, in retrospect, a very smooth passage. I got to Hawaii, uh, and I had a few, the plan was to spend a week in Hawaii and then to continue on toward Japan, but I had some repairs to do on the boat. Uh, but by the time the repairs were finished, typhoon season had started in Japan, an early typhoon season. So after much pondering and analysis of, of weather charts, I decided to stay in Hawaii for a year. Uh, but you know, Hawaii is an expensive place to hang out and uh, I didn't want to do nothing. So I became a bartender. I went to bartending school and became a full-time bartender at Waikiki, uh, which was interesting. And several of my Temple University of Japan um, students came to, to see the, the Dean uh, working at the bar. I was tempted to stay in Hawaii, um, but I decided to continue on to Japan. So in 2013, I sailed from uh, Hawaii to Hakodate in, uh, in Hokkaido. Uh, the first half of that passage was heaven. Uh, the second half was hell, um, but I managed to get to Hakodate in, in one piece. Um, and after doing some more boat repairs in Hakodate, I continued on to start the circumnavigation of Japan. As I said, the plan was for it to be a two-year circumnavigation, uh, but it turned out to be three. Year one was uh, the red line, I go around Hokkaido clockwise, and then down the Sea of Japan coast. <clears throat> the plan was to go to Okinawa, um, but because of typhoons, I, I could only get as far as Fukuoka, and I left the boat in Fukuoka for the first winter. The second year from Fukuoka, uh, straight southwest to Yonaguni, which is the westernmost point of Japan. Uh, to do a circumnavigation, you have to go on the, outs on the outside of the northernmost, easternmost, westernmost, and southernmost points, and then return to where you started. So hence the why I had to go to that, the far lower left-hand corner of the little island of Yonaguni, the westernmost point port of Japan. And then from there, I went a little south to a little place called Hatterema, small island, the southernmost point of Japan, the southernmost inhabited point of Japan. And then up through the Ryukyu Islands uh, and into the Seto Inland Sea. Uh, I spent my, uh, left my boat for the second winter uh, near Hiroshima. And then uh, following the Green Line, I uh, went up the Pacific coast back to Hakodate. In that second, on the map, you might be able to see a place called Suoshima. Um, at the end of my second year, I met some people at Suoshima, and at the time I was thinking about, well, Japan seems like a great cruising ground, but there's no information. So I should try to gather some information, write a cruising guide. But for that, I needed a base to write, a, a home. Um, to make a long story short, the people in Suoshima uh, invited me to live on the island. They built a dock just for my boat, and they found a, a beautiful, Ocean View uh, farmhouse uh, for $150 a month. So it was a hard offer to turn down. So um, 
uh, after completing the circumnavigation in year three, the green line up to Hakodate, then I uh, returned down the Sea of Japan coast for a second time and into the Seto Inland Sea to start living in Tsuoshima. Um, things changed along the way. I met and married a woman and now I'm living in Fukuoka um, and but cruise for uh, several more years um, after that. So in, in the process of going around Japan and realizing that it's a great cruising ground, I, I came to appreciate the wonders of what maritime Japan is, is like. You know, uh, I spent all my life in my 25 plus years in Japan in the Tokyo area. And I might go to the ocean occasionally for a, a weekend trip, but I never really thought of Japan as a, as a maritime country, and certainly not a maritime culture. And most Japanese don't actually think of themselves as a maritime culture. But maritime Japan, the, the, the Japan that goes along the coast, is, is a marvelous place. So let me tell you some of the wonders of Japan in summary. This is not complete, but it gives you an idea of why I think maritime Japan is so wonderful. First, the scenery. And the great thing about the scenery is the diversity. Uh, you know, you have uh, coral islands in the south and you have rocky uh, mountain islands in the north. Which is not surprising, if you think of the Japan geography, the latitude of northern Japan is about the same latitude as Montreal. And, and the latitude of southern Japan is about the same latitude as, as Key West, Florida. So you have the same range of, of geography uh, uh, as you would um, in North America. Just as some, some photos to give you a feel for, for the, the wonders of Japanese maritime uh, scenery. Uh, this is the island of Hatorama, that southernmost point of Japan. This island of Yonaguni, the westernmost point, uh, point of Japan. Then up through the Ryukyu Islands, this is an island ca called Kakiroma, small island, a beautiful place. I spent a long time there. Almost got stuck there uh, for many years. Uh, the, the island Amami. Amami, I would, I personally think Amami is one of the great unknown gems uh, of Japan. It's a beautiful island and, and lovely people. Uh, so this is a scene in Amami. This is also Amami. 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 It's a beautiful island. Highly recommended for anybody who has a chance to travel there. Going further north, the Goto Islands off the west coast of Kyushu are another great, uh, beautiful area. I really enjoyed uh, cruising around there a lot. This is also the Goto Islands. Goto Islands. The Goto Islands. Then into the Seto Inland Sea. Uh, the Seto Inland Sea is, is a great cruising ground. Uh, it's a bit challenging in terms of lots of shipping traffic, uh, fast currents, high tides, um, but it, it's a great cruising area and a great uh, area for a lot of different maritime activities. So this is the, this is the island where I, I lived for a while, Tsuoshima. This was similar to the view that I had for my uh, $150 a month uh, farmhouse. Tsuoshima. This is a small port in the Seto Inland Sea. Then going up the Sea of Japan coast, this is the famous uh, Totori sand dunes. Go up to Hokkaido, very rugged scenery of Hokkaido. It's also the, the northern, uh, north coast of Hokkaido, Abashiri. So that gives you a a flavor of the diversity of, of scenery uh, that you get in Japan. The second great thing about Japan uh, is the people. Um, we know the expression omotenashi, the friendly hospitality uh, in Japan. It is, I mean, it's evident everywhere in Japan, but particularly in, in along the coast where they don't get a lot of visitors and they're incredibly hospitable and helpful to, to visitors. This is the island of Yonaguni. 
this guy with his, his grandson uh, made me feel welcome, uh, drove me around the island, uh, invited me to, into his home to use his bath, uh, etc. This is the island of Kakira, that I mentioned. Uh, these two kids on the beach uh, became friends of mine and we, we play, played on the beach with their friends uh, almost every day. Up along the Sea of Japan coast, um, there's a certain theme about uh, Japanese omotenashi uh, and friendliness and hospitality, um, perhaps symbolized by this photo and the next few photos. Uh, this is a, a sake uh, brewery. Uh, the woman on the left is the, uh, the president of the sake brewery. The, the woman on the right is her daughter. I was there to buy a couple of bottles of their sake. Uh, it's a famous place for cruisers to stop, actually. Um, but uh, I did consume sake at a few other places around Japan. Uh, this is a Suoshima. This is a on, on my boat in Tsushima, the gentleman to my right, or to my, on, uh, in the white shirt, sitting to my left in the photo, he was the mayor of uh, Tsushima, the, the gentleman who invited me to live there. These are sailing friends in Kochi, more drinking. These are uh, instant friends I met up on the Sea of Japan coast. We uh, bar hopped around uh, the little town of Ajigasawa and then ended up back on my boat to continue the party. Um, next day went and talked to the mayor. I'm not sure how that happened, but I ended up advising the mayor on something or other as a result of our drinking session. There's a, a, a couple uh, live in a, a, a town that is disappearing. Uh, one of the things I learned about Japan that is sad or appreciated is the shrinking population. Uh, Japan has about 3,000 municipalities. Only eight have rising populations. All of the municipalities have shrinking populations and many towns are, 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 are dying, com completely uninhabited. Um, this couple, a lovely couple, they invited me to their home to use the bath and have dinner with them. Um, they're the youngest residents of, of the town, the hamlet, and, and they have told City Hall that they will be literally there to turn off the lights. When all the other residents have left, they'll be there, the last ones there. Uh, to basically close the town down. Uh, it's a sad reality of, of life in, in rural Japan. When you travel around uh, Japan, the, the, the fishing industry uh, is very dominant. Uh, and you tend to moor in fishing ports and get to see what's happening uh, in, in the fishing industries all around the country. These are sea cucumbers uh, up in Hokkaido. Uh, also in Hokkaido, these are harvesting uh, scallops. Um, that same place in Hama on where they're harvesting scallops. Um, this gentleman on the left works for the fishing co-op and he's uh, preparing a shucking, uh, turned out to be buckets of, uh, <clears throat> of, of scallops. The guy on the right on this photo is my sailing friend, uh, Mr. Sasa, who took me under his wing and uh, and educated me on how to sail in Japan, which is quite different in various ways from sailing in most countries. We ended up getting about three huge bags of, of scallops each, so it lasted us for a week of dining. And when cruising around Japan, you really can't, uh, you get a, a tremendous feel for the history and culture of, of Japan. And, and very different from what you see in Kyoto or in most other large cities in Japan. These are just some photos to, to give you a feel for the history and culture that you see and experience as you're going around the coast. This is the Amaksa area of Western Kyushu. These are uh, Utase fishing boats, still actively used for fishing. Um, they were in uh, very actively used um, in the 19th, uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, but still, uh, the, there's about 15 boats that still are actively fishing using the traditional techniques. Again, that's Amax area. This is uh, Dejima, which of course is important in Japanese history and Japanese maritime history. 
different type of history and culture. Uh, Gunkanjima, uh, one point, uh, had the highest population density in the world, uh, now abandoned, but it was a very active uh, coal mine uh, in the, in the 20th, last half of the 20th century. There are actually, in addition to Gunkanjima, there are many other islands uh, in the same area that were active, uh, supported active coal mines and had uh, very large populations on the islands. One or two of them uh, you could actually visit uh, and go down into the mines. Uh, many places you go in Japan, you see uh, Shinto shrines uh, along the shore, uh, usually uh, dedicated to uh, uh, one of several uh, sea-related or fishing-related gods, Ebisu or uh, Sumiyoshi or Wakazumi. Uh, so these various uh, sea fishing-related gods. This one is a, a shrine in Tsushima, an island uh, between the mainland of Japan and, and Korea. This is a famous shrine at Miyajima near uh, Hiroshima. Um, the, my company name is Kompira, and Kompira is the name of a, uh, a temple uh, for dedicated to the, the, the sea of the god and the, the seafarers and protector of seafarers. Um, for some strange reason, the temple for the, the number one god to protect seafarers is far away from the ocean. You have to climb up a long, long, long flight of steps to get to the temple up at the top. It's in Shikoku, in Kagawa Ken in Shikoku. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, photos, uh, innocent photo that it is. Um, in the Seto Inland Sea, there's a, uh, there was in the 16th century, uh, a female samurai, uh, named Tsuruhime in the island of Omishima. And uh, she, her father died and she took over uh, protecting the, the family uh, shrine. And when the island was attacked by a, another clan, uh, she uh, put on her samurai armor and uh, waged a naval battle uh, and, and killed uh, the, uh, the leader of the enemy clan. Uh, so very famous. Uh, in this part of the world uh, for being you know, a female uh, samurai. Uh, sadly, her, her boyfriend died in battle when she was 18 and she killed herself. But for a few, couple of years, she was a, a fierce samurai warrior. Um, people don't talk much about pirates in Japan, um, but uh, this is a there were pirates throughout Japan, particularly the Seto Inland Sea. Uh, this is a, a museum for Murakami Suigun, which are one of the main uh, pirate uh, clans uh, of Japan. A fascinating history into uh, what the pirates did and how they survived and how they're incorporated into um, the Japanese state and sort of became the, the beginning of the Japanese Coast Guard. There's a festival on the island of Yuge in uh, the Seto Inland Sea, and these uh, procession is heading to the ocean where they had a sea purification ceremony. Uh, for more contemporary culture, uh, there's the art festival, triennial art festival on the island of Naoshima and the Seto Inland Sea. On the Sea of Japan, uh, there's a famous place uh, famous for the Funia boathouses. Uh, these boathouses uh, were the fishermen of the small boats, the boats would go inside the house and they would live above. And along the bay, there's about 300 of these boathouses that line Ine Bay on the Sea of Japan coast. Um, from the 18th to the early, uh, 20th century, um, uh, trading ships called Kitamae Bune uh, traveled up and down between Osaka and southern Hokkaido, uh, buying and selling as they went up and down the, the ports, up and down the coast, stopping at various ports along the way. This is a half-size half model 
of a Kitamaya brunette. This marks the entrance to a, uh, one of the best natural ports in the Sea of Japan coast. It was uh, mentioned in the ancient chronicles of Japan, uh, uh, Nihon Shoki in the seventh century, eighth century, um, and for over a thousand years, uh, boats would stop here, uh, going up and down the Sea of Japan coast, uh, going to or from Korea. The white building you see is the first wooden uh, Western style uh, lighthouse ever built in Japan, built in 1865, I think it was. And for a bit of fun, uh, in the island in Sado Gashima, Sado Island, you can ride a Tarai Bunet for a bit of fun. So that explains what, how wonderful the Sea of Japan, uh, the Japan coast is, and, and what a marvelous place it is to, to travel and explore, uh, and why I think it's a great place uh, for marine tourism. But marine tourism generically is rather vague. What does it mean? How do you do marine tourism? Uh, and so there's not a single type of activity or definition for marine tourism, but in general it would be uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, activities uh, along the coast. And yet you can do that in many ways. So I'll, I'll just describe some of the ways that you can uh, enjoy the wonders of the Japanese maritime environment. The obvious one, especially for me, is, is cruising. So some photos from cruising. This is my sailboat moored in the island of, of Kakinoma. As I mentioned, generally when you cruise around Japan, you stay in fishing ports. Uh, there's a fishing port called Taisha. Uh, Izumo Taisha, famous shrine west coast of Japan. This is the fishing port nearest uh, Izumo Taisha. Um, you can also stay what they call sea stations, which are small little mini marinas or docks for visiting boats. This is uh, Hirado, one of my favorite favorite places to stop, Kirado Castle up on the hill. There's a sea station, the Seto Inland Sea. Uh, another one in the Seto Inland Sea. This is near where the uh, Tsuruhime uh, female samurai uh, statue was. A lot of marinas in Japan, there's about 100 marinas in Japan uh, that offer visitor moorage. There are a lot of random docks. Uh, when you travel around, there's docks that you can use. Uh, this is at that Shinto shrine uh, in uh, Tsushima. <coughs> Another random dock in the Seto Inland Sea. And of course, you, you can anchor in many places. Not many people actually anchor in Japan, one of the unique aspects of cruising Japan, but uh, you can anchor. Um, there's a small boat in the lower center part that you can see there, that same boat uh, moored in uh, the Goto Islands. So if you don't have your own boat, you can, uh, yacht chartering is also a way that one should be able to uh, enjoy uh, marine Japan. This is a charter boat that I chartered several times. It's a New Zealand guy who actually runs, uh, operates this boat. Uh, and it's a 55 foot catamaran, great charter boat. I once chartered it for 10 Canadians for a two week cruise of Seto Inland Sea. Um, uh, subsequent tours were planned, but uh, Corona uh, killed those plans. Uh, great uh, charter boat, We two weeks uh, through the Seto Inland Sea from west to east. Delicious meals on shore every day. Surfing is another activity uh, to do in many parts of Japan. Um, this is Ishigaki uh, in the south of uh, Japan. Uh, this is near Tokyo, Shonan Beach area near Tokyo, Kanagawa. Mount Fuji you can see there. So there are many surfing areas, Ishigaki, the main island of uh, Okinawa, Amami, uh, 
a world-class uh, surfer once told me that uh, Amami was his favorite, favorite place to surf. Um, the east coast of uh, Kyushu, uh, Chiba and Kanagawa areas around uh, Tokyo and so on. So there's lots of surfing opportunities in Japan. Kayaking, uh, great place to kayak. Uh, the west coast of, of British Columbia and, and Washington State, great uh, kayaking opportunities. And I think that uh, Japan could be just as good. Uh, this is a Canadian couple that I arranged a, a kayak tour for. They had a great time kayaking around uh, Seto Inland Sea. They did kayaking down in uh, Ishigaki. Uh, supping, stand up paddle boards is also a, a popular activity uh, a lot of tourists enjoy. This is down in uh, Okinawa. Uh, Ishigaki, also Ishigaki. Diving uh, is uh, yet another marine activity. This is uh, up in northern Kyushu, uh, Goto Islands. Uh, this is in Okinawa. Okinawa. So there's lots of great uh, diving spots. A good friend of mine is a diving instructor and, and uh, tour leader, and he takes uh, diving tours. Uh, to set to inland sea all over west coast of Kyushu and, and all the islands of the, of the Ryukyu chain. Sport fishing. Um, you, know, you can do sport fishing really throughout Japan, uh, but western Japan, a lot of uh, uh, swordfish, Sea of Japan, Pacific Coast, a lot of large tuna, uh, various types of sport fishing. Uh, Japanese are almost fanatical about uh, sport fishing. Whenever I sailed around Japan and I pulled into a, a fishing port, almost inevitably, there'd be several people standing on the breakwater uh, fishing or on random rocks in the middle of nowhere, there'd be one or two or three fishermen standing on a, on a little rocky islet fishing. Um, they'd be taken there in the morning and they would fish and then be picked up in, in the end of the day to go back. Um, so really keen uh, fishermen and fishing off uh, breakwater. So another aspect of, of maritime culture is the cuisine. Uh, the, the food is actually fantastic, of course, and particularly all the seafood. You could eat it, of course. Uh, in an earlier photo, I, I showed the funia, the, the boat houses where the fishermen kept their boats underneath the house. This is in a converted uh, funi. It's been converted into an inn with a, a fabulous uh, seafood restaurant um, at the literally at the at the ocean level. Uh, or you can make uh, Japanese seafood. There are various places that will teach you how to you know make sushi or cook Japanese cuisine. So uh, everywhere you go in Japan, uh, you'll have opportunities to, to eat Japanese food. Many times in the fishing port, a fisherman would, would come up on a boat and just give me a, literally a bucket load of, of fish, squid and various types of uh, shellfish and uh, sea fish. And I'd end up making myself a, a fish stew that would last me a week. But so there are great opportunities for marine tourism, but there are of course a lot of challenges uh, for promoting marine tourism. You know, I certainly never thought of Japan as, as a place for marine tourism. It's, it's not, if you mention Japan to most people, they don't think of the ocean. They think of temples, shrines, maybe anime or manga, or Tokyo, um, robotics, you know, cars or electronics or whatever but not many people think about Japan as an ocean country. Uh, and so uh, how to develop a, a marine tourism industry uh, is a big challenge. So I'll talk a bit about the challenges uh, involved in, in developing or promoting uh, marine tourism in Japan. One is branding and promotion. Um, as Greg previously mentioned, I used to be involved in corporate communication and did a lot of branding consulting 
advising clients on how to build a brand. But to build a, a brand in Japan as a marine tourism destination, destination marketing is a huge challenge. Um, first of all, uh, what do you promote? As I mentioned in this previous slides, you can go sailing, surfing, kayaking, diving, etc. But how do you package all of that in, into, into a, a simple message for, for building a brand? Uh, many of you may know that uh, Niso, Niseko up in Hokkaido has become world famous uh, as a place to go skiing and attract skiers from around the world. And you know, Niseko and Hokkaido generally have, have developed a, a, a skiing brand uh, developed mainly by Australians, not by Japanese, it was Australians who, who took the lead in building up Niseko as a, a great uh, skiing destination. Uh, but it's easy to build a brand for one sport or one location, but multiple activities at multiple locations nationwide uh, is, is much harder. Now, uh, very many markets, uh, many audiences um, uh, around the world, uh, different languages. Um, and then, well, who's in charge of doing the branding and promotion? Is that a national campaign? Uh, who's going to pay for it? Uh, so the, all the issues around branding and promotion, how do you create a marine tourism brand for Japan as uh, a huge challenge? It's doable, but there, there are those, those branding promotion challenges to, to be overcome. Perhaps the biggest challenge is that of finding service providers. I introduced various types of activities that uh, you can do along the oceans of Japan, uh, but there are very few uh, service providers, uh, people or companies that can that provide those services. For example, uh, for support for supporting uh, cruisers, I'm the only one in all of Japan who actually does it, makes a business out of supporting cruisers. Um, uh, yacht charters. Um, there are you know. By Western standards, there's only one or two people, uh, the New Zealand guy that I mentioned and one Japanese guy down in Okinawa that, that do what foreigners would consider to be a yacht charter, uh, where uh, you, know, you can go out for multiple days, not just for a half day, but for multiple days. Um, one related to the, to the yacht charter you know, service provider challenge, is that in the West, in most countries, um, you can just rent a boat and go sailing. You can't do that in Japan because you need a Japanese sailing license. Uh, so that means you always have to rely, have a skipper to, uh, to go with you on the charter. Um, and that makes it uh, much, more, much more difficult. Um, the charter industry is not really uh, developed at all as a result. For example, um, there are, uh, in Turkey, there are uh, 10,000 uh, charter boats. For all of Europe, there's about 60,000 charter boats. Uh, in Japan, there's five. So 10,000 in Turkey, 60,000 in, in all of Europe, and five in Japan. And as I said, only two of those would actually go up for multi-day uh, charters. So the, you, know, you want a charter, but, but who's going to you know, take you out on the boat and go, go sailing? Um, surfing, there are actually quite a few uh, people who, surfing instructors and surfing schools and, and whatever. So that's okay. Uh, for kayaking, um, there is no company that does Western style you know, kayak tours, you know, multi-day tours where you take your, your tent and your sleeping bag and you, you go kayaking for a week or two. Uh, there's nobody in Japan that does that. Uh, similarly, uh, supping, uh, stand up paddle boards. There's a few that do that just, you know, an hour or two rental, but serious uh, sup uh, tourism is, is not really established in Japan. Uh, diving, there are lots of diving instructors, uh, uh, they're all, all local. Uh, 
place by place. So the lack of service providers uh, makes it hard for a foreign tourist to access uh, or participate in the great activities that are possible, that should be possible. Related to the, the lack of service providers is the lack of English ability. Even those individuals and companies that do uh, provide services, uh, such as the surfers or the divers or whatever, uh, virtually none of them speak English uh, and don't promote themselves in the, in the international media. So very difficult for a, for a foreign tourist to learn, to find out somebody who can give English uh, advice or support for surfing or for diving or, or whatever. So the English ability, as with choose almost everything in Japan, lack of English ability really makes things more difficult. And there are regulatory issues. I mentioned the fact that you need a, a Japanese license to be able to uh, sail a sailboat. Um, also, uh, the regulations for registering a, a, a boat to be able to carry paying passengers are very strict and, and make it almost impossible for some sailboats to be registered uh, for uh, handling fee paying passengers. Uh, cruisers, people coming into Japan on their own boats also face a lot of uh, paperwork problems and regulatory issues, especially dealing with customs. Um, the rules for governing foreign boats go back to 1635. Uh, when Japan closed itself off to uh, the outside world in around 1635, they passed, uh, they had an, issued an edict closing all foreign, all ports to foreign boats except for Dejima. That law is still in the books. The, the text for the 1635 edict was put into the 1899 shipping law. That shipping law is still in effect today. So there are, no, there are no laws or policies to support foreign cruisers. All the laws and policies are related to large commercial ships. So all the laws and policies and procedures that cruisers have to follow are the same ones and the same paperwork uh, that uh, cruiser, individual cruisers have to follow. So it makes life much more difficult as part of one of my businesses is handling all the paperwork requirements um, for cruisers uh, in Japan. Uh, there are other regulatory issues uh, as well. Uh, each sector has its own challenges, especially when it comes to dealing with fee paying uh, customers. But despite the challenges, I still think the potential for Japan as a, as a marine tourism mecca is huge. Uh, so I'm trying to start with step one to promote Kyushu as a marine tourism mecca. Um, I mentioned briefly that I, I met and married a woman as I was cruising Japan. Um, I uh, met my wife at a marina. Uh, my wife uh, is a marina manager. She's actually being trained to take over the family business, which is Japan's largest marina uh, manager. So uh, with her together, we have submitted a proposal to the tourism agency to promote Kyushu as a marine tourism mecca. Uh, and it's not official, not final, but we've been told informally that our proposal will be accepted. Uh, if so, then we start in April, uh, April 1st, uh, to start promoting uh, Kyushu as a marine tourism mecca. So what that will involve, in, in, as, a, I can say, as, a, as a step one or a test case for promoting the marine tourism in Japan is to Kyushu. First, we're gonna, we're gonna identify 21 service providers. That, as I mentioned, that's gonna be the biggest challenge is how to find 21 service providers that we can uh, promote uh, to overseas customers. Uh, the reason for 21, there's seven prefectures in Kyushu. So an average of three locations or providers per prefecture that gives us 21. It won't be three per prefecture because Saga, for example, is much smaller than Nagasaki, um, but in total, we'll look for 21 service providers um, throughout Kyushu, uh, including Amami, uh, in various uh, activities. So, you know, a couple of divers, uh, a couple of uh, fishermen, a couple of kayakers, whatever. We'll try to look for people who can provide uh, you know, services uh, for 
uh, foreign tourists. Then with that, we're gonna build a, uh, a Kyushu Marine Tourism website that will uh, extol the virtues of, uh, of Kyushu, the Kyushu Marine environments, so in a way similar to this slide presentation, uh, visually making people appreciate uh, the wonders of, of uh, the Japanese and specifically the Kyushu Marine environment. And then with that, I started branding a promotion uh, campaign uh, with a logo and uh, uh, you know, taglines and advertising. Uh, we're already in discussion with History Channel. Uh, History Channel is indicated that they're very interested in, in doing a series uh, on uh, Kyushu Marine tourism. We're gonna be filming, filming a demo episode in January or February, and if they can get advertisers based on the demo, then we will uh, do a series of, of Kyushu Marine activities uh, for the History Channel that will hopefully be broadcast uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, again, that is not final, and this project is not final, but that's what we're working on. And then with that, we'll lay the foundation for a Kyushu Marine Tourism NPO uh, that will bring in you know, national, regional, prefectural, local government officials, large companies, small companies, individuals, and so on, uh, to try to get a buy-in from all the key players on building uh, Kyushu as a marine tourism destination. Now, as a former branding consultant, I should tell you that the order of these activities drives me crazy. The order should be the reverse. You lay the foundation, you, you plan out your branding approach and strategy, then you build the website um, with the service providers that you can find. Um, so this is not the correct way to do it from a, a professional branding perspective. Um, we, pre we initially presented a three-year proposal to the tourism agency that would go through this step. Um, you know, steps four and three would be done in the first year and then uh, two and one would be doing the second and third years, but the tourism agency told us that they can't provide a, a commitment uh, of, of three years of support. And the first year has to have, have really solid deliverables that they can point to at the end of one year and say that good progress has been made. So to satisfy the bureaucratic uh, priorities, uh, this is the order in which we're gonna try to promote Kyushu as a marine tourism destination. So that is uh, what we have in mind for Kyushu and as hopefully step one in promoting Japan as a marine tourism destination. With that, I say thank you very much uh, for your attention. Hope that was uh, slightly interesting and informative for you. And this, by the way, is a photo of me just after I completed my three-year Japan circumnavigation. So thanks for your attention. Look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much. So we have a few questions in the queue here. The first one is, uh, I'm wondering if you have written or documented your experiences sailing along Japan or if you have plans to. I, th I think you may have mentioned one of your original goals was to write a book um, and noting that the photos themselves would make a lovely book. Um, yeah, so yeah, the, the initial plan was to, to write the cruising guide, uh, and, which is why I settled in Suoshima. Um, but then I said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. I got married and now, now I have a three-year-old daughter. My wife is very busy, so I'm Mr. Mom. Uh, so that project has gotten delayed, um, but I haven't given up. Um, if you uh, go to my website, which is a bit of promotion, www.compira-consulting.com, uh, uh, or if you just Google Compira, it will come up probably. Um, I'm writing a series of uh, introductions to my favorite ports, uh, three ports per, per post. I've done now nine posts of my favorite ports, so 27 ports. Uh, and I also did a six part series on cruising routes for Japan. So the elements for the cruising guide uh, are, are on the website now. And uh, eventually they'll all be bundled into a a book, uh, be it digital or hopefully paper. Um, so I'm working on it uh, and I've got other people providing information, but it's a longer term project than I had planned. 
um, but it's still in the works. All right. Um, so we have a, a second question, which I think is kind of a kind of a fun one. But uh, one of our attendees asks, "Are you looking for interns?" Um, uh, I might be actually, um, if the pandemic um, uh, slows down or if Japan opens up. Um, I'm actually really busy right now, um, and the marine, if the marine tourism project is uh, confirmed, uh, I'll be really, really busy because I'll be the main person doing all the work for that project. Um, and if Japan opens up, the number of foreign cruisers that come into Japan, I think will increase dramatically. Um, so uh, I actually am thinking of hiring staff, including part-time staff and interns, if Japan opens up. So uh, yes, uh, that's a possibility. Okay, so here, here's a question. This is, um... In Japan, does the navigation equipment have English language? I, the the questioner can type a little bit more about that. I uh, maybe it's a question about like charts and whatnot. But are there are there soft is there software available for cruisers that would have um, you know shipping lane charts and that kind of thing in English, or is it mostly oh, in the, Japanese? The, um, uh, several aspects of that. The charts, the paper charts themselves are all in English and Japanese. So if you buy the paper charts, that's fine. The Japan Hydrographic Association uh, developed a great uh, charting software called NUPEC. Um, and it is fantastic charting software. It's much better than the charting software available for other parts of the world. It, it really is uh, superb. It's in Japanese only, um, but I do provide an English language manual for how to use it. Um, for people cruising Japan, you know, for a long time. Um, the uh, charting software, uh, Navionics, uh, CMAP, uh, that most foreign cruisers use, they have Japanese charts. They're not as detailed as the charts in, in NUPEC, and I, I don't encourage my clients to rely too much on them. So I, I advise my clients either to get NUPEC or to buy the paper charts, which are English and Japanese. Uh, one question, do they honor the American Sailing Association certificate as a sailing license in Japan? Or I suppose, do you need no. a separate? No, you have to have a Japanese, they don't recognize any overseas qualifications or certificates. You have to have a, a Japanese sailing license, which is not easy to get. Uh, you need to study for it. You need to make it, take a, a test. The test is now in English. Uh, you have to take an on the water test as well. So it's not the type of thing you could just fly in on a day and get your license and then and then sail away. Um, you have to have a Japanese sailing license, which is, takes time. Sure. Um, an interesting question: Are are repair parts available, or I suppose how readily are repair, repair parts available for typical cruising sailboats? Um, uh, there are sort of generic parts, for example pumps or you know rigging or whatever that you can uh, readily get um, and if it's you know specific parts for foreign equipment you can get them you know delivered in Japan by express mail in, in two or three days so you know I cruise Japan you know almost year round for six years and obviously need a lot of parts etc along the way um, so I, I stocked up on parts that I thought I needed and then uh, I bought parts in Japan or had them shipped in as necessary. Japan does not have chandleries, you know, large marine goods stores, uh, as is common in the in, in US and many countries. Um, but there are little one man, little cubby hole shops that the guy has access to all the catalogs. And then he orders from the catalogs and has it within a day or two. Uh, so the short answer is, uh, there's no problem, you know, one way or the other, you can get all the parts you need for cruising Japan. Uh, okay, so you mentioned that sailing is different in Japan. On a, on a high level, was there something specific you were referring to by that comment, like conditions and policies, or, or what, what, what exactly were you referring to? Um, so sailing there, is well, different. There's, there's the, um, 
There's regulatory ones, uh, the closed port issue dating back to 1635, but there's a permit to get around that and customs issues, et cetera. But setting aside the regulatory issues, the biggest difference about cruising in Japan is that you, you tend to moor in fishing ports. You know, overseas, you tend to either anchor or you go to marinas. Uh, in Japan, you go to fishing ports, uh, which are uh, they're great because they're well protected. And Japanese concrete industry has done very well by fishing ports, they built double and triple breakwaters uh, and well protected. And with the declining fishing industry, you could always find an empty spot in a fishing port to tie up. Uh, you have to tie up to concrete walls. Uh, so you need big, you need jumbo sized fenders to keep her off the wall. And with the tide going up and down, your dock lines will scrape against the edge of the concrete wall. So you need to rig uh, wire links or chains to prevent the, your dock lines from scraping on, on the concrete wall. So mooring and fishing ports, as opposed to anchoring or uh, uh, you know, at marinas is the biggest difference. And then the, the, the question might ask, well, why can't you anchor? And all the, if you go look at a chart, looks like there's lots of good anchoring bays, lots of little bays, well protected, but those are all, almost all are fishing ports and have been fishing ports for a thousand years. You're not allowed to anchor inside harbor limits, mainly because you would you know, be in the way of, of the fishing boats coming and going. And even if you did anchor a fishing port, there's so much junk on the seabed, you may never retrieve your anchor. Um, and then other places that might look fairly good on a chart, if they're not fishing ports, they're aquaculture areas, lots of fishing nets and, and floating, you know, fish farms and whatever. And so what that leaves you with is generally very exposed places with, you know, wind and waves and making life uncomfortable on the boat. So uh, in general, uh, there's not a lot of anchoring. Having said that, there are some places to anchor in the Ryukyu Islands and the Goto Islands, set to inland sea. So there are anchoring places, you know, particularly if the weather is not too bad. Um, but for me, as I mentioned, what makes Japan great is probably its people and its culture. If you're anchoring out, you know, anchoring out in, in a lovely bay in Japan is not that different from anchoring out in a lovely bay in, in British Columbia or Alaska or whatever. Uh, what makes Japan special is, is being with the people and going to the restaurants and, and all that. So I, I never anchored in Japan. My anchor, uh, once I left Hawaii, or actually once I left Victoria, my anchor never uh, experienced salt water. Okay, let's see. Uh, do you have a favorite specific story that happened to you while cruising around Japan? Uh, wow, <laughs> so many. Maybe, well, the one that comes to mind, I, I showed the, the, uh, the photo of, of, of a couple, you know, look like farmers uh, that uh, mentioned they're taking me to their home for bath. That was a real highlight. I pulled in this little fishing port and I walked around and the fishing port itself was, you know, almost uninhabited. 90% of the buildings were shuttered, abandoned, whatever. And it was a very sad place. And I was walking along the, 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 the beach and I, there's this woman walking her dog. And I said, excuse me, are there any hot spring or public baths here? And she said, no, there used to be, but they're all closed now. I'm sorry, you know, why do you ask? And I said, well, I'm on the, the sailboat over there. And if there was a bath, I'd like to have a bath, but there's no problem. I can, you know, I can survive without a bath for tonight. And you know, goodbye, sign out. And I wandered back to my boat. By the time I got back to my boat, there was a car parked out front. The man in the car rolls down the window and says, my wife says you're looking for a bath. Would you like to come to our home? So I went off to his, uh, to their home. And I arrived, the, the bath was drawn, the towels were out and they said dozo. So I had a lovely um, bath uh, and I got out, finally home and they said, well, it's just a simple meal, but why don't you join us for dinner? 
and went into their little dining area. And it was a, a feast fit for a king, you know, shellfish and, and sushi and vegetables. And it was just a, a, an amazing feast uh, there. And uh, so I spent time with them and uh, uh, learned their story and learned about their lives in this little community and whatever. Um, it was it, just, it was a great one day experience. And I sailed down the Sea of Japan coast the, the second time and I went back to see them again and they, they greeted me as if I was their, their long lost uh, cousin. And they you know, took me out for you know, a bath and uh, by car you know, far away to a, a proper hot spring bath and took me up for dinner and whatever. So uh, I'm still in touch with that couple. That's a very, it was a very special um, experience. Like, so one other story, which is also says something about Japanese culture and baths. Um, sailors, Japanese sailors, by the way, rank the a fishing port in terms of destination by how good and how near the bath is to the fishing port. And I went to Suoshima the first time I was on my bicycle and whenever I leave my boat, I put a sign on my boat that says, you know, if there's some problem, please call this number. My phone rang and the man says, I see you're moored here. You probably want to go use the bath, the public bath, the, the hot spring, but it's far away to go by bicycle. So feel free, feel free to use my car. I did, I'd never seen him, didn't know who he was, but he's, he said, I'll leave the, the car by your boat with the keys in it. Just, you know, you know leave it there when you come back. So I, I, did, I went, went to the bath in his car and I came back and then he joined me on the boat for, for beer and sake. And then we went for more beer and sake at his home. And long story short, that's how I got to the point of having the town build the dock for me uh, and having a, finding a home for me to live. It was because of being invited to use the car. So. Sorry, I'm still muted there. Uh, so I have one question. This is sort of a long question, and I'll just read the whole, the whole thing. So respectfully, how do the locals and their authorities feel about this project? And I think this refers to the project that uh, you and your wife have, have the grant project you've applied for. Um, are they heavily involved? Are there way are there ways and wishes being looked after to be res respected and understood? and prioritized in this venture. Coming, this is coming from the premise that the Japanese people should be placed and kept front and center in things like this. Um, yes, of course, my wife is Japanese. So it's uh, so you know, uh, the, how this project happened is the, the tourism agency went to my wife and my wife's company said, um, we've got some money available. Um, would you like to make a proposal? And so my wife talked to me and said, well, you know, what proposal should we, uh, we come up with? So I you know, developed this proposal for the marine tourism proposal. Um, uh, the, the, questioners, the question is a good question. Uh, and it's probably the, the, the most important issue. As I mentioned, the, uh, the, the, the four steps of, of the Kyushu Marine Tourism Project are the reverse of what they should be. So the first step should have been building uh, an MPO, uh, establishing an MPO with all the key players uh, involved, uh, you know, uh, government officials at different levels, the, the service providers, uh, people from the fishing ports, the fishing associations, the fishing co-ops, etc., uh, which would be 95% Japanese and Japan Japanese led. Um, so that's how I would, that's how I initially proposed that that project, that this project be undertaken is by establishing an NPO. And I would be an advisor to the NPO, but I was hoping to find a, a, Jap a senior Japanese, you know, respected person who, who would take the lead. And I had a few people in mind, um, but the tourism agency said that they only fund us for a year. Going through the, the process of establishing an NPO wasn't viable. Um, so my hope is that by the end of the process, it'll be, it'll be a, a Japanese-led project and I will fade into the background.
sorry, I had some mouse issues there. I have two questions left then. Uh, firstly, is there any wildlife tourism in Japan? Um, thinking of whale watching tours as you might see in the Pacific Northwest. Um, no whale watching as far as I know. There are a couple of uh, dolphin watching tour locations that I'm familiar with. Uh, it's actually something I'm actually, when I, when I think of it, it makes me upset. There are no regulations on how close the tour, the tour watching boats can get to the dolphins. And so they end up chasing the dolphins and, and almost running them over uh, so that people can get good photos of the dolphins. Um, so coming from Victoria with there's very strict rules on how close you know, the, the whale watching boats can get to the whales. There's no such rules like that in, in Japan. So um, I will definitely not include the dolphin watching tours in my Kyushu uh, website. Both of the, the, the dolphin watching sites on Fumu are, are both in Kyushu. I will not include them in, my, in the website because it, I think they mistreat the dolphins. Mm. Okay, so I, I said two more questions, but now there are still two more questions. So uh, one, mooring and fishing port, ports sounds interesting. In Michigan, there's a significant amount of animosity between motorboats, including fishing boats and sailors. Do you find the same to be true in Japan? Um, I, I had heard that was an issue before I came to Japan. I've been told that was the case, um, but it's much less now. I've, I, uh, Never, I personally had never had any problems. Uh, I've never been told to leave a fishing port, uh, never made to feel unwelcome. Um, the situation is a bit different. The fishing ports near uh, Tokyo, I hear, are problematic. Uh, that because they're, they're full, they're crowded. And so you're, you're taking out valuable space. And, and there's lots of, of sailboats in, in Tokyo area. And so on the weekend, you get hundreds of, of cruising sailboats that go out and they want to, if they moor in the fishing boards, there's no place for the fishing boards, boats to moor. So there's a, a conflict in the Tokyo area. Um, but on the other hand, there's, there's lots of marinas and, and sea stations uh, for moorage of sailboats in the Tokyo area. Um, so that's not it. So in general, that is not a problem. It was a problem in the past. It's not a problem now, and particularly because the Japanese fishing industry is dying. And the, the, uh, the fishing ports are, are, are largely empty or maybe only half full from, in most places, a few exceptions. But I would say 90, 80 and 90 percent of fishing ports have lots of lots of room. Uh, and now they're, they're happy to see visitors and, and you know, come in and spend a bit of money in the store, the restaurants and whatever, and, and they're happy to see visitors. So uh, it's, I mentioned the, the fishing port that you know, has a history of over, over a thousand years of boats on the Sea of Japan, boats going to and from Korea, et cetera. They used to have 200 fishing boats and more than that uh, port now, uh, port like 50 years ago, they had 200 fishing boats. Now they have five. Mm. So that leaves a lot of room for visiting cruisers. Yeah. All right. So la the last question, and I think we'll wrap things up, but um, discounting. So let's discount Suoshima uh, because you end up living there. But uh, beyond that port, about how long did you sp did you stay in each port? Where did you stay the longest and what kept you there longer compared to other places? Um, well, In general, what kept me the longest in any given place was repairs. Uh, anybody who's a sailor will know that you have to do a lot of repairs. Um, and probably the, I spent a year in Tokyo um, because waiting for a new autopilot to arrive from France, but it was in August. Of course, French people don't work in August. Uh, so, so it took a long time to get the autopilot. Yeah, who, nobody wants to work in August. There's, well, in Tokyo as well as the heat. Um, so if you set aside waiting for parts or repairs, whatever, uh, places I spent a long time because I wanted to. Um, uh, I mentioned the island of, of Kakiroma um, a couple of times, a couple of photos there and <clears throat> the two girls on the beach. 
um, I had a, a sailing friend of mine who lived there. And it was the reason I went there to begin with. And I just became friends with all the people there uh, and uh, became a member of the community and uh, got involved in so. And uh, typhoon season was coming and I kept sort of looking at the calendars. I've got to go, I've got to go. And they say, well, we've got a barbecue in three days. We'll stay a little longer. So what would plan to be a two night stay turned out to be three weeks. Uh, and I, I made such good friends there that I actually ended up going back by plane a couple of times just to visit my friends. So Kakinoma uh, was probably the place that I, I lingered the longest because I really wanted to linger because it was so enjoyable. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, I'd just like to say thanks again for coming to, to join us today. It's been a, a really a fascinating story. And I, I, I remember personally, I remember watching, you know, on, on Facebook at the time, we were, we were early Facebook adoptees, I suppose, but watching your, your travels and, and just being like, wow, that's just a really cool thing to do and the insights that you had about Japan and um, places that you saw that I think, you know, most of us, whether, <laughs> whether American or Japanese, right, don't get to, um, was really eye opening. So uh, I wish you, you know, the best of luck and personally look forward to the end of the pandemic so I can get over there to see you guys again. So Thanks much. I look forward to seeing you here, Greg. Uh, look, go out for another uh, uh, great meal like we did last time. Oh yeah, absolutely. So thanks very much. And, and thanks everybody for attending tonight. Um, those who joined late uh, will have heard, I, there were a bunch of questions. Um, you will have heard that there's a recording of this. It'll be made available later on. So you can watch and, and rewatch and certainly send any questions into CJS that you might want us to forward along. Um, and we'll have those back to you in the near future. So thanks again, everybody for coming. We will um, see you all next week for the next talk.